What up, what up, what up? Welcome back to Sam Dunks, the weekly NBA show over here at Slab Stocks. I'm your host, Sam. I'm joined today by my boss, the founder of Slab Stocks, Aaron. I'm here in Milwaukee with him, and so I'm here at his studio able to record with him. Uh, we have a Q&A today. Aaron put out the call for some questions, and uh, we're going to answer them. So let's get right to it. Question for Sam is which players are going to make a splash this offseason? So I guess if we're talking about offseason splashes, you're really thinking of uh, you know player movement, and obviously like the latest um, you know biggest rumor has been Damian Lillard. If Damian Lillard was traded, he's going to be the biggest splash, and, and really sure sounds like something could be happening. I don't think Portland wants to trade him by any means, but uh, if he wants out in the player empowerment era that we're in. Uh, certainly could be traded if that's the case. Uh, his cards and, and his market and his popularity just should skyrocket because he's going to be able to get himself to a contending team. He's one of the you know one of the most exciting players in the league. So you know Damian Lillard, uh, you know Ben Simmons, he seems likely to be traded, although his stock is so low. Um, but I also think maybe his stock is even lower than it probably should be at this point. If he went to a, you know maybe it was like a D'Angelo Russell for Ben Simmons type of trade, you know something structured around that and. Put him next to Carl Towns and um, and uh, Anthony, Edwards. Anthony Edwards. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> you. You put him there with those guys. They're handling the scoring brunt. Uh, you know that'd be exciting. But there's, you know, there's other players that with player movement, things could shift around. Um, you know, if Jason Tatum on the Celtics, great young player, he's not going to get traded. But if the Celtics start making some moves this offseason, I assume they do. Uh, the Celtics get better, and and Jason Tatum, his stock starts rising, and you know, there's other guys too. You know, Bradley Beal. Every year we hear trade rumors about him. I still don't think he's going to be traded. Um, and really, honestly, there's just not a whole ton of of free agent, you know, you know, top line free agents available. Um, so these guys, these types of players, they're going to be commanding a huge premium. And since I don't think Bradley Beal's necessarily going to get traded, I kind of wonder if Zach Levine might get traded. Uh, just because he's going to be like the next best scoring guard that potentially could be, um, you know, had in the right deal. I don't know if the Bulls necessarily are going to want to pay him his next contract, and I think it'd be wise uh, for the Bulls to be able to trade him this off season and, and get something for him. So yeah, I don't know. There's there's a lot of different player movement, uh, you know, things to try and forecast, and players that are definitely going to get traded. Um, but yeah, that you know, we're talking about off season. Uh, players and, and the impacts on the card market, so much of it has, just has to do with going to new fan base and, and exciting a new uh, group of buyers. I got a question. Can Ben Simmons to Minnesota work out well for not only him but the team as well and his cards in turn? Because to be completely honest, as rough of a postseason as he just had, he's still really good. There's right. no denying he's really good. And his cards are so much lower than they've ever been before. So would it make sense to maybe buy a Ben Simmons this offseason when people are just, you know, so much hate's coming his way? Yeah. Yeah, it's tough because, you know, if I think we know enough about Ben Simmons by now to realize that he's not going to be the guy in the playoffs. Um, he's not going to be scoring in the fourth quarter. You know, he's that's probably just not what he's going to be. The things he does well, he does really well. And I think some, you know, if it was Minnesota, I think some of his, you know, talents really kind of mesh well with the rest of that roster there. No offense to my Minnesota brethren. I don't think they're planning on contending anytime soon. So his big weakness in the playoffs probably won't really show through as much as it did in Philadelphia, where they really had, you know, their eyes aimed on showing up in the finals as the, you know, the entrant from the Eastern Conference. So... It could help the team, and and also some of his, his weaknesses might be minimized in Minnesota. Also, certainly get the spotlight off of him uh, playing there in Minneapolis. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's kind of a risk. Even You know you know your money situation better than, than I do, obviously, um, and your risk tolerance. So it's definitely risky, but I, I can't imagine his market ever really gets much lower than it currently is. The way that that... that series went and three shots total in the fourth quarters combined I think it was and I mean just kind of humiliating all around and and so yeah he's he's pretty much at, at the basement of his market it has to be 
so yeah, conceivably, if he's traded and and starts impressing again, things could start trending in the right direction. Shifting focus to the future here, we just had the NBA draft lottery. Which draft picks this upcoming season will be the biggest ones to watch in the potential superstars, especially with how the lottery shook out? Well, I think I mean obviously the big one is Cade Cunningham, and like I have a lot of family and friends that are Detroit Pistons fans so like I'm super pumped for the Pistons to win the lottery although we've been hearing stuff about maybe maybe they won't take Cade or they're looking at the top five guys I think if they're sticking at the first overall pick they're obviously going to be taking Cade Cunningham and you know just perfect fit there they need a superstar they don't you know they've had draft picks they've had good draft picks they had a really good draft last year but what they need is that star player, and that's what Cade Cunningham is. He's he's a he's a big guy, uh, you know, big wing guard, secondary guard type of, uh, you know, positionally. Um, but he's going to be bringing down the ball. He's going to be dictating the offense. He's going to be able to get to his spots. He's not like the most overpowering athletically, but you know, similar to like um, you know, like Luka Doncic type, where he's not doesn't exactly just drive by you, but he can just put the ball in the basket wherever he is, and you know three level scorer and and just make things happen on offense both for himself and for his teammates uh you absolutely need that type of player in the nba if you're going to be successful and i think Cade cunningham is that but then you know some of the names that are right after that um you know jalen suggs jalen green um evan mobley you know the top four they're all really really good i think it's Cade cunningham and then the next three are just a little bit behind him but but they're all, all three of them really good. Jalen Green, just super hyper-athletic wing, um, good shooter. If he went to the Rockets or something like that, you know, I think that would be an awesome fit alongside KPJ. Um, Evan Mobley, um, you know, a big two-way um, center, kind of a you know, very athletic, very mobile center of the future type of guy. Not a super great three-point shooter or anything like that by any stretch yet, although sure seems like that could be coming soon. I've heard a lot of comparisons between him and Anthony Davis, which is pretty unfair, but you know, I think like the next generation's closest iteration of Anthony Davis could be a, a good description of what he might bring. I would love it if he went to the Cleveland Cavaliers, got to team up with Darius Garland. Um, that would be just awesome in my mind. And then, uh, then uh, Jalen Suggs, Minnesota boy. Yeah. If, if the Timberwolves would have been able to keep their pick, that would have just been a perfect fit for them. Uh, did not happen, but Jalen Suggs, just super high IQ point guard, kind of a streaky shooter. Um, but, I mean, imagine if he goes to Toronto and he's teaming up with uh, Siakam in the post and then he's got uh, Van, Vliet. Van Vliet next to him, two ball handlers, just dynamic you know, creators for everyone else. That would be awesome. So, you know, I think those are the four biggest names. Kaminga, I would assume, would go fifth and probably to Orlando or something like that. And, and honestly, I haven't watched a whole ton of him, but that's the name I've heard. <laughs> so, those are the big four. And I'm super excited for all of them. All right, next question is, what are some players on some weak teams with potential for a breakout this season? Um, Well, since we just talked about Cade Cunningham, you know, I... I think uh, Killian Hayes is a name that comes to mind. I really liked Killian Hayes before the draft. He kind of had a really rough start. He was injured most of the year. Started getting better as the season went on. Um, love Killian Hayes, though, or I, I would love him to be good. And having a, a two-ball handler lead you know, initiator tandem there in Detroit for the long haul, um, that'd be kind of cool. That's kind of the way the, the NBA is trending, is you really don't want just one player that, that can dictate the offense. But, you know, if you have two guys that can do that, uh, if Cade Cunningham's taking off a lot of the pressure from Killian Hayes, I wouldn't be super surprised uh, to see Killian, you know, kind of, you know, just really improve this year. Um, yeah, but you think of other guys, you said bad teams, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, the Bulls, they didn't get their pick this year. They had to um, give it over to Orlando. That was in the uh, deal for Vucevic. So, um, Patrick Williams, obviously he was their first round pick last year. He's still going to be their only first round pick for, you know, this couple of years. So I think the Bulls obviously have every intention to continue developing him, getting him as many minutes as they can. Uh, the Bulls, I, I guess they're better than a bad team, but, uh, I would still say that he's going to be, you know, a big focus there in Chicago. And, and I, again, I don't know if Denny, if not Denny, but if Bradley Beal is going to get traded, but if he was, 
I would love to see the ball in Denny Avdia's hand and, and just try and get him, you know, initiating the offense there in Washington. We didn't get to see that from him this last year. That's exactly the role he was playing when he was playing over there in, in Israel and in, and in Europe. Um, so it was a bit of a tough adjustment for him to try and play off ball in, in more of a traditional four or stretch four type of position. So I'd, I'd like to see him, you know, be put with the ball in his hands and kind of dictate from the top of the key and see what he can do. Uh, if the if the Wizards start cleaning house and start building around him, I think that'd be a, a good option too. So not having to only do with bad teams. So what are some other players that might break out this season and you know and really show up and then hopefully you know progress their markets forward too. Sure, um, I love Darius Garland I, and he he went from a really 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 bad rookie season. Uh, to last year, just really impressing, but he's still just on a terrible team. So I guess I could answer this with the last <laughs> question. Um, but you know, I I really like Darius Garland. I would, you know, they're going to have a top. Th- they have a top three pick. Uh, get someone in there with him. Obviously, a lot of people like Colin Sexton. I'm not as high on him. You know, they got Jarrett Allen in there too. So you know, they have pieces building around. Um, but I think they're going to obviously be getting a, a pretty high profile draft selection this year. And and. Um, if it was Mobley and Darius Garland, if it was Jalen Suggs and Darius Garland, I don't know. Any of these combinations would be really good, and I, I think Darius Garland is going to benefit a lot. Uh, great team player, and and uh, he he should really benefit and potentially be a, a breakout. He's here in his third year, and and that's usually when we see these type of breakouts going on. Uh, I think of like uh, Jaron Jackson Jr. You know, we're still kind of waiting for his breakout a little stay bit. Stay healthy. He's yeah, stay healthy, man. You know, missing his third season. And being just injured the whole year, and a lot of people just have kind of forgotten about him. Um, I think that's another option for a breakout. Hopefully, the the Grizzlies don't try and pigeonhole him into you know you know this like basketball nerd like this is what you have to do type of thing, and, and just kind of let him play because I think offensively he has a lot of ability. He just hasn't really been able to do it yet or showcase any of that. He's still only 21 also. Yeah, super young. Crazy. Super young, super athletic. If he could stay healthy and, and get those minutes this year and the Grizzlies are better for it, I could see him as one of those breakout guys. And then, um, you know, Marvin Bagley is another name that comes to mind. Not because, not because I like him. I'm probably probably bad mouth bagley more than a baseball <laughs> well like a couple of years ago before i got here and and aaron and nate were always like well we love bagley we love bagley and i was like and then he oh, got hurt guys. like a million times and then i was like guys you need me to come talk basketball because this is so painful so so but his stock is so low right now <laughs> yeah. and i i assume they're gonna have to trade him this off season if they trade him and he goes somewhere and there's no expectations at all it literally can't get worse for him than it was this past year in Sacramento. So I could see like a mini version of a breakout there and, you know, maybe people, you know, seeing this as an exciting new opportunity for me, a big change of scenery guy there. Um, and this isn't a breakout, but I'll, another guy I've been thinking about is Pascal Siakam because the Raptors were so disappointing last year. Yeah. And, and I think a lot of that had to do with them playing in Tampa all year and, not being at home, not neither on the road nor when they were playing home, where they actually, you know, there in their homes with their families. So, um, I think Raptors top four pick this year. They have to be better than they were last year. Siakam, he had a down year pretty much the whole year, um, and I don't expect that to continue. So, um, not really a breakout since he's already been an All Star, but kind of fits in that category too. His market's so insanely low tier right now. Oh, yeah. I don't know if he looked at his recent sales, but yeah. I'm pretty sure like a Prism Silver PSA nine sold for like fifty bucks rookie. Like just really in the dumps compared to what it was when they were making those playoff runs. Yeah. No, yeah. Losing Kawhi really changed a lot for them, but uh the ramp they still have a great coach and they still have a, a lot of good two way players and I think there's just so many different factors involved last year that made the Raptors what they were. It's gotta change. So we've got a question here. Thoughts on premium stock complete set. Also, Shimmer versus Flash Parallels. So the new premium stock, Hoops premium stock this season came in 2019. And it had a lot of different configurations between the complete set, the Target edition, which was like the Pulsars. And then it had like the Collector's edition, which were all numbered. And then it has all the hybrid boxes, the mega boxes. Just so much premium stock, so much uh, supply out there. And... At first, I really actually liked those complete sets with the Pulsars. I thought, you know, a card that's not printed insanely high 
Um, once they start to get graded, the population shouldn't be super high. I do like those cards a lot, but the problem is, is when there's not longevity with the, with the certain set, and then they introduce a new set, but they introduce it with insane quantities and insane parallels and flash parallels and all this other stuff that people have a hard time figuring out. It's really hard to figure out what's actually going to stick going forward or what people are going to value three years from now, four years from now. I mean, a lot of people just go and turn to the stuff that they know, you know, buying the hobby parallels from, you know, actual prism with the, the blue ices and the purple ice and the oranges. I know those are all more expensive than the hoops premium stock, but in reality, that's why they're worth more because people know what they're buying. There's a chance of those, the, the premium stock parallels, uh, the pulsers from the, the complete set do pretty decently in PSA 10, PSA 9 potential copy as it does, is, you know, stick some artificial scarcity on top of it versus just that they're released via sets to target. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I, I, I'd say like my perception of Hoops Premium stock was higher at the time it came out as the market has suppressed a bit for basketball and really in general. I mean, more, more supply gets put out there between Select. This year's Select is going to be ridiculously printed, as we saw in football. It's going to be even worse for basketball. Um, I just see that there's too many options now to where it's hard to gravitate to something that's new that has not been there for years before. So I would probably recommend maybe saving the money at this point. If you made a decision in the past, um, that's something I've had to learn too is, you know, I make a mistake. I got to learn from it and move forward and make a new decision. And I'd say that that's probably the case here is to go and find those things that people can really, you know, latch their cards to because they know it's been around for a while and Hoops Premium Stock isn't something that is like that. Maybe that changes, you know, three, four, five years from now if they cre keep creating the set, but it's going to take a lot, I think, to move the needle on that set. Last question for today is what are your thoughts on the vintage basketball card market right now? The way I see the vintage basketball card, and not only basketball but baseball and football too, is that it's so hard to actually like read how the market is going to do in the future because these players, unless unfortunately they pass away or they make the Hall of Fame, which doesn't even really affect it at the time. It's more like the three years prior, the lead up to it, that people start to get that in their mind. Um, there's just not that much that can go on to affect the card prices outside of just straight consumer demand. And the fact we've already went through two massive demand spikes for vintage over the last like six to eight months makes me not as confident that you can like, you know, always expect that to happen because the way I've been seeing is the more spikes that happen in big drops, the next one always gets a little smaller, a little smaller, or more people get detracted from buying in the future because they see the huge drop. And then it starts to build over time though. Cause now we're at a point to where the vintage basketball market dropped a ton from the peak, you know, in February ish. And hopefully now what happens is it starts to build a baseline that can grow steadily over time, which is what vintage cards were meant to be and meant to do. Um, not three X in the, the course of, you know, yeah. a month. Cause all, all, you know, over the past 10 years, as I've been collecting cards, it's always, you buy a vintage card, you hold it for 10 years and you maybe, you know, gain 5% year over year, like any sort of investment that's, you know, a long-term one. And, and that's what I think it's meant for. That's what I think it should be looked at as. So if you are buying vintage basketball or are buying vintage baseball or football, please go into it with that mindset. Um, don't buy hoping to quick flip because a massive demand spike comes um, that would you know kind of be reckless with that segment. And that's not to say the entire card market's like that because you see players that change their legacy like DeAndre Ayton in this postseason, like Trey Young, like Devin Booker. Um, now, of course, you know you have to be very correct to get those, but like there is stuff that can actually alter players' cards currently still in the market when it is down. And that just isn't the case for Vintage because they're not going to go out there and drop 50 in a playoff game right. or win a series for the Suns. Yeah, you so. need, a, need a catalyst a lot of times and you're not getting that if you're tired. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right, thank you so much for joining us today. I appreciate the questions. Uh, for those of you that sent them in, thank you, Aaron, for having me here in your house and yeah. also uh, joining me for Sam Dunks today. Uh, as always, it's a pleasure. I appreciate your time, and uh, we'll see you next week.